All right, salamu alaikum. MashaAllah, that was much better than last night. I'm proud of you. <laughs> you actually remembered most of you. And I even got smiles back, not from everyone. There's a brother there that was scowling really big at me. <laughs> All right, we're supposed to be talking about where we go from here, right? We've been talking about all of the problems that we have. We've talked about a lot of different ideas and everything. But now what? What are we going to do? What are we going to take away from this meeting? That's a good question. I'm not sure I have an answer. So we'll throw out a few more ideas rather than answering. We'll just toss out a few more ideas. You know, that's what you do when you don't have an answer. You ask questions. I think that we have spent a lot of time talking about the problems, specifically the problems in this country and this society and how we're going to change them. And I think we're putting the cart before the horse, as we say, which means that you have to take things in a logical order, all right? We are, at this time, not in a position to be talking about changing any place else because we have to look at ourselves. I mean, we really have to look at ourselves. The brother talked a little bit about this. He touched on it. Well, I'm going to just slap it right up the side of the head for you. All right? There are many of us who are uh, introducing ourselves as being Muslim and presenting Islam uh, to people and presenting an idea of people and even presenting that we should change everything that it would be in line with their thinking when I question whether or not a lot of us even have the right to call ourselves Muslim. I do. I question whether we have that right. I question it because I listen to the brothers and the sisters putting across ideas that are not the way that we are supposed to be thinking. We as Muslims, when we see something wrong, we are to enjoin the right and forbid the wrong. And that includes within our own actions, within our own attitudes, with our own thoughts. We begin with us and then move outside from that. We need to identify, first of all, whether or not we are Muslim. What does it mean to be a Muslim? A Muslim has a special bond with the creator of the universe. That's what we say. We have this special bond with the creator of the universe because we have direct access, no intermediary, no one going in between. Because we have the Quran, which is the perfect, uncorrupted word of God that was recorded at the time of delivery, not from the memory of man and has been preserved for all of this time and will always be preserved. Okay, we're a step ahead because we have the messenger of Allah who was the example for us, the clarifier, the explainer. And that's supposed to set us above and beyond everybody else. But you see, it doesn't. It doesn't because we're not applying it to our own lives. We are not living Islam. We are not living Islam. We are not filled with love, compassion, and mercy. And to be a Muslim, we must be filled with love, compassion, and mercy. We must be willing to put others before ourselves. We as Muslims are still busy blaming other people for our problems rather than taking responsibility for our inaction and for our actions. No, we're not ready yet to start making changes in the world. We can't make changes in the world until we reestablish Islam within our own hearts, within our own actions, within our own thinking patterns. We should love Islam more than life itself. And we should care more for our brothers and our sisters than we care for our own well-being. 
And we should recognize that as vice chairman on this earth that we are responsible for the well-being of every other human being, regardless of race, religion, creed, color, whatever. We're responsible for their well-being, as indeed we're responsible for the environment and for, as the Native Americans call, our four-legged friends, all of the animals as well. And yet we go around in a state of selfishness thinking only about what is in our best interest, not in the best interest of other people. We go around in a self-absorbed state where we don't even consider the impact of what we are saying and doing will be. And every word you say impacts upon someone. Every action you take impacts upon someone. This is why we are told not to waste our word and to guard our tongue, and we're warned that the word can be a dangerous thing. You must be careful what you say and who you say it to. That's why there is not one way of presenting Islam. That's why there is not one way of doing any particular thing. The Quran itself says that we speak to people in the way that they will understand. Not the way we understand, but the way they will understand. There was a young man once who was talking to people about their zeal to uh, convert the universe to Islam. And he said a very simple thing that struck home to me. And he says, look, you can't teach me anything if you hate me. You can't teach me anything if you're afraid of me. You cannot give me anything if you resent me. Those words were so true because if you are afraid of a people, if you resent a people, if you dislike a people, if you do not care about a people, if you have a hate for a people, you can do nothing to change their situation. All you will do is make things worse. So again, I question whether or not we have Islam in our hearts, whether we have Islam in our intentions. Or has our ego gotten the better of us? Is our nafs speaking out so loud? Are we so concerned at impressing people and impressing each other that we've forgotten what it is that we are supposed to be? We should be humble before Allah, knowing that he has given us gifts beyond our wildest dreams, hope beyond our wildest hope. Knowing that Allah is there with us and giving us the guidance and the knowledge that we need to be successful both here and in the hereafter. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always going to be there as the perfect friend, the perfect companion, the most merciful, the most compassionate, the most loving, the most pure. Teaching us how we also should be exhibiting love, compassion, mercy, friendship, protection, purity. When we have corrected our own hearts, when we have corrected our iman, when our adab is truly Islamic, when Islam is the beat of our heart, then we can talk about what it is that we're going to do to change the other people. But you may be surprised how little you want to change other people when you actually begin to live Islam because you will quit being so quick to judge. Allah is the judge. You are not. You do not see the action behind the, the word. You do not see what is written in the heart of indivi any individual, no matter how great their words may be. You cannot judge. You have no idea what the end result will be of any human being in this room or in the universe. My words may seem harsh way to end this, but that's because I'm not trying to end something, I'm trying to start something. I want to start you to thinking and examining where you are and what you are really doing. I don't want you to be lemmings. You know what a lemming is? I mean, they run in little herds and one jumps off the cliff and every other lemming jumps off the cliff as well. Okay, you're a Muslim. If you're a Muslim, 
then you are to seek the knowledge, you are to seek the understanding, and you must apply that to every aspect of your existence. Not following blindly the way other people say or the way other people have done. You are responsible. You are personally accountable before the creator of the universe. No one can defend you. Indeed, no one will want to defend you on the day of judgment. The only defense you will have is your own hands, your feet, your tongue, your heart, your Quran, your actions. Are you ready for that? When you are ready to face the creator of the universe, when you have lost all hesitancy, when you are ready to face the creator of the universe, then you are ready to change the universe. Salamu alaikum. Dr. Jeffrey Lang is a professor of mathematics at the University of Kansas, and um, he has written two books on Islam in America, uh, Struggling to Surrender and Even Angels Ask, and he's currently writing a third one. So good luck, inshallah. He embraced Islam in 1982, a year after receiving his PhD from Purdue University. He's married and has three daughters, ages 12, 14, and 15. And that's pretty much all I know about. So. <laughs> so, all right. Tonight, inshallah, we'll be talking about, and those are his words, and he'll do the explaining, inshallah, the exile of American-born Muslims. That's it. All right. Salam alaikum. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I, the exile of American-born Muslims. <clears throat> What am I going to talk about? Uh, <clears throat> I'll begin with, with a question. What is the largest group of Muslims in America? The mar largest group of Muslims in America? Well, of course, uh, among the Muslims, what's the largest group? Well, let's see. Um, men? No, maybe not. Women? Uh, immigrants? Uh, converts? I don't know. Well, let's uh, just try to... Uh, calculate that, roughly. Uh, they say that in the United States there's somewhere between, some estimates are as low as four million Muslims, some are as many as eight. Let's take the median, the median between those two, let's take six for our hypothesis here. Let's say there are six million Muslims in America right now. I think that's, it doesn't affect the calculations all that much. But let's say there are six. Estimates are that there is a, a, approximately a million of those six Muslims, approximately a million of those are converts. Okay, so we'll take the million or so converts and put them on the side temporarily. That leaves five million other Muslims. Okay, but wait a minute, for a second, let's take those five million and those million and put them back together. Look at that six million Muslim population. Most of those Muslims are family members. They come from Muslim families. The average Muslim family has at least three children. Muslims seem to have, like to have children, so they, maybe four or five would be a proper average. But let's say three, just to make it conservative. So that says in a family of five Muslims, we have a three that are children. Three that are Americans born in this society to Muslim parents. That's 60% of those six million Muslims are Americans born from, of Muslim families in America. 60% of 6 million is 3.6 million. Toss back in a million converts, that's 4.6 million. 4.6 million out of 6 million is at least 75%. Somebody tell me where they are. Because I go from mosque to mosque to mosque around this country, to Islamic center, to Islamic center, to Islamic center, speaking to Muslim audiences, and I don't see them. They're unrepresented in almost every audience I see. Oh, you might have one, two, three, four, five showing up at conferences like this, maybe even 10 or 15. But if you go to most Muslim communities about America and you go to their masjids, you go to their community meetings, you go to their community events, they're not there. In Lawrence, Kansas, where we said this have somewhere now, the estimates are between 500 and 1,000 American born Muslims living in that community and the surrounding communities. 
Do you know how many show up to the Friday prayer, week in, week out, or to community meetings? Two, myself and one other. Where is that 75%, the invisible 75% that we rarely see? Through the past 50 years, there's been a large-scale, steady flow of immigrants to, the America, to America from Muslim countries through the past 50 years. There were large-scale immigrations before that, but for the past 50 years, almost half a century, we've had a sustained, continuous influx of Muslims from throughout the world. And although they have created American Muslim institutions like MSA, ICNA, ISNA, AINA, or I think AMC, various uh, other abbreviations and et cetera, the religion has not really taken root in this country, even after half a century. Because in order to take root, it has to take root among the indigenous population, among the born population. We've been here half a century. When I entered this religion back in 1982, and I used to go to the mosque to pray, I would find that the composition of the mosque consisted basically of immigrant Muslims and visiting foreign students, and a handful or two of converts to Islam. In the 1990s, early 1990s, whenever I would go to a mosque anywhere in the country, I would find that the majority of that community would be immigrant Muslims, visiting foreign students, and one or two at most converts in that congregation. When I go to the mosque today, the situation is the same. In 50 years, you could, make, you could have at least three generations of Muslims. Where's the second and the third? We want, we're talking about taking the world, taking the message of Islam to the world, winning the modern world to Islam. We're not even winning with our own children. <clears throat> so we have to start asking why. Now we normally hear the usual excuses, the negative image of Islam in America. We could always blame it on the press. But Let's face it, I mean, over the last 50 years or so, the press has become a little bit more balanced. Oh, you still have some demonization. I guess if they talk a lot about the Taliban and the oppression of women there, according to the you know, American media, the destruction of the Buddhas. But that kind of stuff doesn't really affect the outlook of our children. They could toss that off as prejudice, and they usually do. Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one, according to the U.S. government. The Soviet Union is no longer the, public, the enemy, so Osama bin Laden will have to substitute. <laughs> but again, one person or the fame or, or disfame of one person is not going to drag our children away from the masjids, not from our communities. We have to really start thinking more seriously about where have all our children gone? as the song used to say back in the 60s, where have all the children gone? <clears throat> well, how can we find out? Well, you could start by asking them. But usually, if we, if we ask our children why they don't seem to have the same commitment to Islam, the same love of Islam, the same commitment to its in, going to its institutions and participation, they're usually not going to elaborate on their reasons. Because they know that if they tell us that we will not like what they hear. I had interviewed young Muslim kids at the University of Kansas and at other universities that have no participation whatsoever in their communities. And they come to me and they tell me all the doubts they have about this religion, all the reasons why they're skeptical about it all the problems they have with this religion. I said, did you ever talk to your parents about it? Most of them said, they always have the same story. I asked this question once, my father just belted me. Or I asked this question once, and my parents said, you're not a believer. Or I asked this one question, and they told me, if you keep on thinking like that, you're going to get out of this house. So they learned not to talk about it. 
just to keep it to themselves. There are some ways to tell if you actually go out and solicit their response. In the past several years, I've been getting hundreds of emails from American Muslim kids. I really can't answer them all. <clears throat> but I ask them for their reasons or their, whatever problems they might like to communicate to me that they have with this religion. <clears throat> and you'll be quite surprised at the depth of the questions and the problems that they have. One me another method, aside from soliciting information from them, another me method is just go to the websites and chat rooms that they go to, to the various Islamic websites and the various chat rooms, and see the discussions that take place there. And record that information. And start pouring through it and see what their problems and their issues are. It'll be quite, it's quite revealing. So far I've collected several hundred pages of data on what our children are, and converts also, because they're part, they're part of the American Muslim sector of our society, charting what they have to say about our religion and what problems they have and why they're not participating and why they're drifting away from this religion. Because half of the people that email me start from the, begin with this remark, I either think or am no longer, um, I either think or am, or I either think I am or no longer am a believer. I think I'm becoming an atheist. <clears throat> so where have all these children gone? Well, now I don't, this is not scientific because I'm soliciting this information. This is not a, an objective poll. But you could guess what some of the problems are and they're rather obvious. One of the main problems I, they have is a clash. They see a clash between the culture that they grow up in, the surrounding culture, the culture that helps to shape their minds, and the culture, the religious subculture, that they're asked to be a part of. This issue of culture class, of separating culture from religion, of trying to separate essential Islam from interpretations of Islam, culturally based interpretations of Islam, is a central issue among that 75% of Muslims in America, that invisible 75%. <clears throat> and there are many cultural issues that they bring up. I don't have time to, to delineate them all, but of course you can imagine what's on the top of their list, the issue of the roles of men and women. No issue looms larger among that silent majority in our community, that invisible majority, than that. And the kids tell me that they have doubts about Islam because they see Islam as subjugating women. I don't want to debate the issue yet. I'm just trying to share with you some information. If you wanted to debate about Islam and women in Islam the other night, that was for the other night. I'm just trying to share some information and outline a very long chapter in my book, in my next book. They say that women are discouraged from attending congregational prayers. Some of them describe the mosque as a men's club, as a Young Men's Muslim Association, the YMMA, one lady wrote. <clears throat> they tell stories of how they were kicked and thrown out of the mosque because they wanted to attend the Friday prayer and not be shunted to some small, dingy, dark room in the back where a couple of other ladies are stranded, where they don't even get to see the speaker. And they have to sit in some closet somewhere listening to the Friday prayer. They tell me these kind of stories, how they fought bravely and maybe with a couple of other sisters and resolutely until they were practically almost bodily thrown out or at least threatened that way. And so they stopped going. And their connection to the community ended right there. <clears throat> I remember when I was back in San Francisco, we had four young lady converts. They all converted around the same time. I have no idea why. <laughs> it was almost a miracle. Four students, female students. Converting to the religion. They almost did it as a team. <laughs> it, they needed to sort of support each other, to give each other courage, to give it a shot. They started tending the nightly prayer. 
the morning and the nightly prayers because the Fajr prayer is pretty tough to get up to and get to the mosque for, but these students made it because they love to hear the Quran recited. Well, several men in the masjid went berserk. What? Ladies in the mosque? One man got so irate that he threatened in front of the entire community with the ladies present that if any more women were to show up in the mosque, he was going to throw them out bodily. <clears throat> the ladies didn't want to be the center of controversy. They stopped coming to the mosque. Three of those ladies aren't Muslims today. <clears throat> Women are denied positions of influence in our community, denied positions on boards of directors, denied representation in the community, political representation, social re representation. We call that disenfranchisement. When you're not allowed to let your opinion and voice and perspective be heard. Community decisions they complain are made almost entirely by men. The women's voice is not heard, except among their fellow women. But since the major community decisions are made by men, they're excluded from that. That's their complaint. <clears throat> women converts, so far, have been a small exception, a slight exception to what I talked about so far, of that 75% was a considerable number of lady converts to Islam that participate in their communities against great odds, or at least that's what they say, that's what they're reporting to me, against great odds. Because not only do these ladies feel, rightly or wrongly, just trying to help us understand why people are not coming that we would expect to be coming. Why the, this majority is almost invisible. What they tell me is that they're treated like second class citizens in the Muslim community. As a matter of fact, they tell me they're treated like third class citizens in the Muslim community or fourth class citizens. Because they tell me on the top you have the Muslim men and then next you have the women from foreign countries, Muslim women from foreign countries, then on the third tier you have the immigrant women, Muslims, and then on the fourth tier you have the American lady convert. Now whether that is rightly or wrongly perceived, the fact that that perception exists should be a concern to us. What are we doing to communicate that perception? I'll tell you right now, the male convert doesn't feel the same. Especially if he is white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Anglo-Saxon, male, he doesn't feel the same. The day I became a convert, it was as if an angel came down from the heavens. There were tears flowing from people's eyes. Brothers were hugging me left and right. People were stopping me in the halls, congratulating me. Some people were kissing my hand. They couldn't get their hand, keep their hands off me. I the day I became a, I went to a meeting, I must have had my, po my pockets were so filled with people's addresses and papers. I looked ridiculous. I looked like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I remember I was driving home and somebody said to me, oh brother, if I could only bring you to my country, this country was Kuwait, if I could only bring you to my country and they could see you with your blonde hair and blue eyes and white skin and your American accent. I thought, God, my God, I mean if the prophets and this message didn't work, what, 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 what am I going to achieve? I don't know, what's, what is this business, of this, color, this color obsession? What, I, I didn't know at that time. I was new. I learned, I quickly caught on later on. But I said, if I was what, a black American? And you drag me in front of that audience, they'd be less impressed? He didn't say anything. I later learned, of course, that was true. <clears throat> but back to the women converts. They claim that they are the subject of derision, they're ignored, they're disrespected, they're marginalized, disenfranchised, ostracized, 
from their own community, that they are not given equal status with other mem members of the committee, especially men, but even other women. They claim that, oftentimes they claim that the women, the traditional Muslim women, treat them worse than the traditional Muslim men. Now I know it seems far-fetched to you. It seems like a fairly open-minded community. <laughs> so much of this probably doesn't apply to you. But I found in my own experience that Muslim men could harbor some, let's say, misogynist views towards women. I remember once a lady and her mom, a student and her mom, came to the mosque to learn about this great religion they heard about. They heard a great speech about Islam and they were so turned on to this idea that they wanted to go to the mosque, mother and daughter, to learn more about it. They arrived at the Islamic Center the brother opened the door to see two smiling ladies standing in front of them, and he slammed it in their face. And he was quite proud of that. He was bragging about it later. Sometimes these prejudices and attitudes could go rather deep. I've experienced it myself. When I was in San Francisco, we had an imam of the Islamic Center. I'm not going to mention the time or the place or the era. We had an imam of one of the Islamic centers, and he was accused, and it was an accusation, by six ladies, by six ladies who attended his Arabic classes, six lady converts. They accused him of sexual harassment. They accused him of making sexual overtures to him. He was married and had children, by the way. They accused him. I'm not saying the accusations were true or false, but the community apparently felt otherwise. He came, they took their complaint to the leaders of the mosque. The leaders of the mosque had a hearing. The women, of course, were not present, but I was. They took a written statement by the women and read it in front of the community members. And then various community members, even the leaders themselves, stood up and began to defend the poor imam. They said, those ladies are prostitutes. They said, they're nothing but American whores. I heard it with my own ears. They claimed that they were B-I-T-C-H-E-S's, as if you know what I mean. I heard one phenomenally demeaning, derogatory statement after the next. <clears throat> Despite all that, and I know you're probably thinking, well, Jeff, you're an American and you're just defending your countrymen. And frankly, I don't like to be put in this position because, precisely because of that reason. I lose some credibility when I do this. But frankly, my God, brothers and sisters, if I don't do it, nobody else is going to because I don't hear anyone else talking about this. I've been in this community 20 years and I just never hear it spoken. <clears throat> No wonder our children feel separated from their community. I only brought up one cultural issue. There are other cultural issues as well, which I don't have time to go into. The children also complain, and the converts also complain, that there is an intellectual divide that they have to face that they cannot seem to relate to the chutbahs, the speeches, the positions, the thought, the perspectives that come from behind the pulpits of the Islamic institutions in America. They can't relate to them. Maybe it's our own fault, you know, because we've pushed our children. We've pushed them to become some of the most educated, some of the brightest, some of the hardest working, some of the most competitive students in America. Our best children are going, our, our children are among some of the best students in America. We have them in Harvard and Yale and Stanford and in the, all the Ivy League schools, in the Big Ten. They're getting degrees in areas of critical research. They're among, they're learning things like Oh, 
critical methods of historical study, literary criticism, textual criticism, form criticism. They're learning some of the most modern and most revealing historical critical techniques. Some of them are becoming scientists. They're becoming leaders of critical thought and innovative thought in America. That is their mindset. And they've, do and they've done very well. But when they go to the mosque, they're told one thing. And when they go to their school, and everything they've learned, and everything they've become, tells them to take another approach. And I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just trying to explain the way, the, what they explained to me. Because in their education, and in their schooling, and now in their minds, they're taught rationalism. Cold, objective reasoning. While in a community, the stress is on tradition. Following traditional thought. Don't quest, question the tradition. Don't raise difficult or controversial questions. They see a conflict there. A conflict of thought. In, the, in their education, and in their society, and in their entire life, they're taught individualism. It has its good and bad sides, but they're taught individualism. We teach them conformance to community norms. Don't rock the boat. Don't, don't make a fitna. Don't create havoc in the community. Don't ask too many questions. One American lady convert back on the West Coast, she converted when she was 53 years old. Her husband had died several years earlier. She discovered this religion by reading the Quran, converted to the religion, and she would be constantly going to the leaders of her community, asking them questions, especially about the role of men and women in Islam, badgering them again and again because she didn't find the answers were satisfactory. And she was attacking them on rational grounds. At first, they politely replied, and then they tolerated a little more, and then they started to get a little bit angry with it, and finally they just told her, just leave us alone. Keep your questions to yourself. You are only a convert. We've been Muslims all our life. You are only a convert. The lady had a reply. She said, so were all the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. <clears throat> Our community, the American community, teaches our children innovation, adaptation, relativism. Our community stresses the eternal and immutable. Our students are taught critical objective research. We're told we teach them to revere the ancient authorities. There is a, they, and they see it as a conflict. They see it as two mutually exclusive approaches that both sides are unwilling to meld, to bring together the two approaches, to seek reconciliation. <clears throat> since our children, since this great 75% of Muslim, are you guys getting exhausted? I could tie this up in one minute. <laughs> I thought you'd want, I tell you the truth, I expected you to want to throw me out of here. but. <laughs> Okay, since this great 75%, at least, this great 75% of invisible majority is told that our communities are the true, practical model of Islam in America. And, and since they have these conflicts, intellectual conflicts with that model they see, they begin to have a difficult time seeing the relevance of Islam in their life. They start to see this as a religion that lacks relevance, perhaps is even irrelevant. And little by little, our, that 75% drifts farther and farther away from this community. There have been entire Muslim communities in America that have entirely disappeared from the past. Not a trace of them left. If you take away right now the immigrants and the students 
from the Muslim popular, from the Muslims in America, the masjids and our institutions will be empty. And those masjids and institutions will be converted to some other secular uses. <clears throat> <clears throat> the children mentioned, I call them children, some of them in their 20s, 30s, even 40s. Some of them are professors at schools, doctors, lawyers. These second generation Muslims and converts report that they have problems with other issues as well, which I don't have enough time ago to get into. They, just, they talk about problems with classical Islamic theology. Theology is a theory are theories we construct trying to understand a relationship between God and ourselves. Theology is a theoretical enterprise of man. They have disagreements and problems with the classical mythology. The essential classical mythology is the school of Al-Ashri. The other essential school was the Mutezila. They debated it out for the first few centuries. The Al-Ashri's viewpoint finally went out. But our Young people really can't make any real, find any real relevance in either approach. <clears throat> they seem see major conflicts between both approaches and what is stated in the Quran. And part of the problem is, is that when it comes to systems of thought, we always have to keep them alive. The answers and the interpretations and the work of scholars in the past must always be reviewed, critically analyzed, updated. We always have to be checking and rechecking the work of the scholar because no scholar has the final word. This is true in physics, it's true in mathematics, it's true in engineering, it is true in the study of history, it is true in social science, it is true everywhere. If we rely on any century's thought, then we inevitably become stagnant intellectually. And we stop reaching the minds of future generations. Till finally so much time passes where they can't even recover the original uh, irrelevant message a relevance to the message of whatever area of thought that is. But they can't even recover a link between that message and themselves. Because too much time has passed. And it's too hard work. <clears throat> Our children, many of them, are suspicious of the Hadith collections. They learn all these critical methods of historical research and now they begin to have doubts. Why does that happen? Because the science of Hadith has now been put on a shelf and we refuse to revive, the, to, the, that say, to perform that same type of critical research that was done centuries ago. How many real Hadith scholars ISNAD critics, math and critics, historical critics, how much of that criticism is really going on today? Even if that criticism only brings us back to the same point we were before, that is good. But it's kept alive. It's kept alive. The great Indian thinker Iqbal wrote a book about the revivication of the Islamic sciences. He said this is extremely important. We must always investigate and reinvestigate and research the work of the past. Either perfect it or confirm it. Or confirm it. But if you just put it up on a shelf and let the science die and just rely on it, the work of the people of the past, then we become disconnected with it. And we have the problem we have today where there are children no longer have confidence in one of the most important areas of our community building. They're complaining about it. There's a huge distrust among them. Almost every kid that emails me brings up this subject sooner or later. What are we doing to answer them? And I don't just mean 
answer them. I mean, answer them according to their level of thinking, according to their experience, according to their level of thought, according to the techniques of critical investigation that they're learning in American universities. What are we doing to reach them? <clears throat> They're suspicious of Islamic law. They fail to see the relevance of that. The key question they keep asking is how much of this is religion and how much of this is culture? How do you separate religion from culture? They keep saying again and again. How do you tell what is essential to Islam from what is not essential? How do you know when some ideas were added to the religion? And how do you know which ones are essential and orig original, original to this faith? That's the question they're ask asking. We don't even allow them to ask it. And we don't prepare ourselves to answer it. <clears throat> we need to create an intellectual space in this community where these issues can be discussed, researched, studied, confirmed, or revised. We need to start thinking again. We need to start researching again. We need to start critically investigating again. Or else, we're going to lose a generation. Because we're not we will be unable to communicate to them according to their level of thinking. And that's why we have to allow these kids to come into this community. And when they come into this communi community, we have to allow them to voice their concerns, to voice their questions, to make their position known. And then we have to patiently and painstakingly and intelligently and rationally respond to them. Because as long as we fail to do that, we give them a, give them a one way ticket outside of our community. <clears throat> the type of scholarship we need to have, we need to revive all the great Islamic sciences. We definitely need to revive that. Especially here in America, where we are on the front lines of the confrontation. I hate to call it confrontation, but on the front lines of this confrontation between Islamic thought and Western thought. I don't see it as, as it has to be a confrontation, but right now it is that way. And I think one thing we have to do is get out of the bunkers. But in any case, what can we do right now? I'll take about eight minutes of your time and try to summarize that. Like I said, one, create in our communities the intellectual space to be able to start discussing things discussing problems, discussing issues, discussing questions. Because right now, in our communities, we run them like some, one of those, one of those oppressive oligarchies that most of our communities come from, immigrate from, when they come to the United States. You know what an oligarchy is, those, those, where you have a small group of people ruling the entire country, controlling the, all the thought coming in and going out, and not li allowing any dissenting opinions. It seems I've been at the University of Kansas 20 years, and every time a new administration comes to power, it's always some kind of coup. And then after they come to power, anybody who disagrees with them, you no longer hear them giving a Friday prayer speech. You know, they're not allowed to disseminate any information in the mosque. And that group controls all thought, all expression in the mosque until another group could somehow or other manipulate the situation and get their coup. And then the whole situation just starting over and over again. <clears throat> we have to have freedom of speech and expression in our community or at least create the space for it. And that's why I like address addressing Muslim student associations, especially the American-born students there. If you can't find space to have your ideas discussed and expressed, make space. Form another association. Call it the Second Generation Movement. Call it the Second Generation Muslim Association. Call it the American Converts Association. Call it whatever you want, 
but create that space where you could research, learn, discuss, and live to the best of your ability this religion, intellectually and fully. But you've got to create that intellectual space. <clears throat> A lot of scholarship needs to be done. I don't think I've discussed that well enough here today or made my position clear. But a lot of scholarship needs to be done in our community. And we also need to have our community become much more open, where free expression exists, and where we're tolerant of differences of opinion. But frankly, my brothers and sisters, I think that's going to, be too long, going to take too long, and it's going to come too late. Unless we suddenly, radically change our whole approach to what we're trying to accomplish in America. <clears throat> but we can do things right away. We can do some things. And I'm going to make three last suggestions, and then I'm going to say goodbye. And I hope I didn't upset anybody too much today. <clears throat> but, you know, I really don't like giving these type of speeches. I'd rather give a cheerleading speech like I'm often asked to give. Or I'd rather, you know, talk about theology, which is my favorite thing. But I'll, I, I feel an obligation. When I was asked to talk about this speech, I, feel, I felt obligated. So here I am. <clears throat> There's three things we could do. Even though most of us are not scholars, most of us haven't done the type of critical investigative research I thought. Most of us are engineers, mathematicians, or et cetera. We're not social scientists. We're not critical historians, we don't have PhDs in history and the social sciences. Even so, we could still do some things. We could start to approach that issue of separating religion and culture by just being, as Amina said, introspective, by asking ourselves the question, what if? Are we doing something wrong? What things might we be doing wrong? And we could start at, to the best, with the knowledge we possess, we could already start making progress. We could start saying what things in this religion are more tradition and what things are essential. Because in this context, we have to make that separation. Because we are trying to take this religion to these Americans, the second and third generation and converts and non-Muslims. And when we do that, we don't want to burden them with a lot of extra things. We want to only take them to the essentials, because if you add something that is not essential, you're going to draw them away from the religion. You're going to obscure the truth. So for example, here's just a very simple example. I talked about the seclusion of women that exist in many Muslim communities, especially their denial of the ability to attend the prayer on the same floor with the men, as, as they do, for example, in Mecca and Medina. Let us take that issue brothers and sisters. Let us just say, hypothetically, that even though that might be a viable cultural interpretation in another country, let us say that that is not, strictly speaking, essential to the religion. Let us say that we looked in the, in the prophet's record, peace be upon him, and we saw that men and women interacted in the mosque in Medina. Oh, I only need five. Men and women <laughs> reacted, interacted in the mosque of Medina attended the prayers in the mosque of Medina, that that was a family-friendly environment. Let's say we could prove that case. And I think we can. But let's say we can. I don't want to argue it now. But let's say the seclusion practice that is being practiced in our community is not really necessary, essential to the religion. You may have rationalizations for it, but let's say it's not essential to the religion. And now count how many Americans who were interested in Islam, who showed interest in this religion, how many of our children have left the religion aside because of that one issue? Because of that one issue. If that is not essential to this religion, if it is not, strictly speaking, required by this religion, and everywhere that is practiced, that is obscuring people from seeing the truth of Islam, then it's not the press that is driving those people away from the religion. 
It is not some foreign, it's not some Western conspiracy that is preventing them from seeing the truth of Islam. It is us. It is us. It's just a hy hypothetical question. How many people, for how many people in this country is the truth of Islam obscured by practices and notions that we have no explicit divine warrant? All those traditions, if we impose them on people, however small, they could be a barrier between them and the truth of Islam. And the Quran criticizes this, says in no uncertain terms, have you considered what provisions God has sent down for you and how you made some of it haram and some of it halal of your own making? Say, has God indeed permitted you or do you invent a lie concerning God? It was talking to the mushrikeen, people who associate with God that which is not of God. They make something sacred that God specifically did not enjoin. And it criticizes them for that. And it says in another verse, and say not for anything you invent, this is halal and this is haram, so that you invent a lie against Allah. Because when you do that, you commit, as we all know, shirk. Associating with God that which is not of God. And why is that such a serious sin? Is it because God is a jealous God? Is it because his feelings get hurt? Is it because of some personal divine problem? No. The problem with any kind of shirk making something sacred that God has not made sacred. The problem with that is, is you obscure the truth and you place a barrier between the truth, truth and that person and give them an excuse and a reason not to even consider your religion. That's the problem. And the Quran gives trivial, almost seemingly trivial examples. It criticizes in a very harsh way the Meccan polytheists, because they used to slit the ears of cattle. And condemns them for that, for doing that without any divine warrant. Something so small, you're saying? Something so small? The problem is, is when you do that, maybe you think it's small, but later on for another person, that could be, um, give him a reason to dismiss your faith. Oh, look at that, look what they do. Oh, I can't consider that religion. That can't be the truth. That's ridiculous. You know? Quran gives many examples of that, that nature. I'll give you a very simple one. The term son of God. The Jews say the, Ezra is the son of God. The Christians say Jesus is the son of God. That is the saying, with their, of the saying with their mouths. Imitating the statements of disbelievers of old, of deniers of old. What's the problem here? Well, in the mouth of the Jews, Yes, they called Ezra the son of God. They called many other Jews the son of God. In Jewish history, in Jewish terminology, that means one who is loved by God. One who has a special relationship, a special affinity to God. It doesn't have a literal meaning. So what's the problem with using that terminology? Because what happened to it? This terminology, which had no divine warrant, no explicit divine warrant, when it came to Christianity, began to be taken literally. Jesus is the Son of God, God the Son, second person of the Trinity. Do you know there are millions, millions, tens of millions of people in the West that are now atheists and agnostics exactly because of that? They think the statement doesn't make sense. So by just introducing a terminology like that without any divine warrant, has created a huge barrier between people and realizing the relationship with God. So what else can we do? This is the last thing I want to suggest. Yes, we should be more open, create a more open, tolerant environment, invite these kids back into our communities and be open and tolerant and let them have their, you know, let them air their opinions. Not, and when I talk about kids, I'm not just talking about kids, I mean converts as well. Create a more open 
environment for research and discussion. Yes, we need to do that. Second, we must make every effort to separate what is essential from Islam from what is not essential from, to Islam. And we have to really develop some good, vigorous, critical scholars, Muslim scholarship in this country. Because right now, really, brothers and sisters, I mean, let's, let's be honest, we just really don't have any real good critical scholars in this country. I mean, come on. Most of our Hadith scholars are former engineers. You know, most of us going around the country lecturing have degrees in something. You know, we haven't, we haven't learned real research techniques in any of these areas. Let's just be honest. You know, our scholarship compared to Western scholarship on religion looks almost juvenile. I'm sorry to say it, at least as far as this country is concerned. And I count myself as much at, uh, at fault as any of us. You know. But the third thing we could do is follow the model that God gave us in the Quran and in the prophet's life example. What model am I speaking of? Before you know where to, you're going, you have to know where you're coming from. You have to know where you are right now. If I want to get from here to Lawrence, Kansas, I better find my place on the map. Well, where are we right now as a community? If I look at the two phases of the Prophet's mission, peace be upon him, the Mecca phase and the Medina phase, which phase would you think this community is closer to right now? The Mecca phase, obviously. I mean, I don't even have to make the argument to you. We're surrounded by a huge culture that doesn't, hasn't received our message, hasn't even considered our message. <clears throat> and we've had some, been at, faced some discrimination. We're a tiny minority. We're taking a new message. We're facing a tremendous jahiliyyah, to use the Arabic term. You know, that's our situation. We're closer to the Mecca phase. In the Mecca phase, if we're in the Mecca phase, then we should be following more or less and trying to bring people back into this religion, the Meccan model, following the Mecca plan. And now if we look to the Quran, we'll find that 3%, 3%, you just take all the verses in the Quran that are of a legal nature, and then count all the verses of the Quran, take the quotient, and you'll find out that about 3% of them are commands and prohibitions, divine commands and prohibitions. 97% of the Quran teaches ethics, the relationship between God and man, the purpose of life, morality, other truths as well, this, the history of nations in the past teaches us how to be self-critical, um, how to use reason and faith, the extreme importance of using reason and faith, teaches many, many major themes. You know what I was taught when I became a convert? Rules, rules, rules. If I hadn't studied this religion myself and entered this religion and all I received were rules, 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 I would have left it the next day. Thank God I read the Quran first. If we're going to draw these indigenous people, our own children, that second, third, and fourth generation, those converts and non-Muslims into this religion, let us begin by following the model established by God himself through his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. As he once said to Mu'adh bin Jebel on his way to become, uh, take the dual leadership of the community uh, in Yemen, he said, as you all well know, he said, first teach them that there is no God but God, and that Muhammad is his messenger. And when they have fully understood that, then teach them how to pray. And when they become consistent in that, and they've developed in that fully, then teach them about fasting during Ramadan. And then once they've accomplished that, then teach them what? About paying zakat and making the hajj, and so forth and so on. He said, make things easy for people, and do not make them difficult, and inform them of the glad tidings, and do not repulse them. I mean, you've all heard it before. You've all heard it before. Do we practice that here? We're trying to win these kids back over to this religion. We're trying to bring a community of people into listening to this religion. And the first thing we do is get them in that door. We tell them, OK, OK, you, cover your hair. You do this. Get rid of the gold. OK, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, I don't mind. I, 
don't mind telling the people what are the Muslim behaviors and, or, or whatever. But that's become our, we, we are obsessed with only that. I have attended Friday prayers for 20 years now in this country. And every Friday it's the same thing. The speeches are either political, about po Muslim politics, or they're about rules and regulations, or somebody's diatribe about you know, problems going on in the Muslim community. They never discuss the other 97% of the Quran. Virtually never. Or else there's just brief allusions to that. <clears throat> and be tolerant. When we bring people into our community, don't expect them to become Middle Easterners or you know, Arabs or Pakistanis or Sri Lankans the next day or ever even. <sighs> you know, give them time to grow into the religion. Give them the space to grow. Give them the room to grow. Give them the right to ask. Give them the right to question. Give them time to develop. The Quran gave them 13 years in Mecca and then slowly but surely brought them along after that. We always put the cart before the horse. Give them time. If, we, if our kids come to our community not so modestly dressed, it's better that they come than not come at all. We have to start, if you know, they have this or that problem. If their behavior is not perfect from our particular perspective, it's better that they come and hear the message. It's better that they work out for themselves what it is to be a Muslim in America. Because that's the generation that's going to have to take this into the future. It's better than, for them to be among us than not to be among us. If the Prophet and his companions adopted our approach there probably be no Muslims today. How about the time the man came and he urinated in the mosque in that famous Hadith report? The companions were ready to kill the guy. The report says that they already had their hands on him. How do you know? Because the report says the Prophet said, let him go. Go get some water and pour it over it. You've been sent to make things easy for people, not to make them hard. Let's follow the Mecca plan. Let's just Give it a try. Do I think, because I've said this to you today, you're going to go out and try it? No way, Jose. <laughs> but if some of you here care about your children, if some of you care about the people of America, want to bring them this message, then I beg you to give it a try. Establish a mosque, a halfway house, call it whatever you want. Make it so that people who feel shy to come to the regular mosque will come to that as they are, to hear the message and to pray, even though they're not perfect, even though they may have flaws that you think you see. No matter what you see, give it, give, establish an institution where we could follow that Mecca plan. Am I talking to the leadership of masjids here? No, because they'll never do what I just said. Am I talking to the leaders of America? No, not at all. They have their leadership, their positions to protect. I'm talking to the parents. I'm talking to the young, young Muslim men and women, the few of you that are here today. I'm talking to that second generation. I'm talking to those converts. Please just do it. And the rest of the community, instead of slandering them and complaining about them and making up all sorts of strange slanders and gossip about them, just give them your support. Give them your support. Know that those people are on a mission. A mission to take this message to the greater community. I know that some of you can't tolerate that, and I understand that. And as Harry Truman used to say, you can't take that kind of environment, so if you can't stand the heat, just stay out of the kitchen. But for those people that are going to take the heat and are willing to work with real Americans and to show the patience and the tolerance and the wisdom and to carry out this plan, 
that Allah once carried out with the people of Mecca and spread throughout the world. For those people who are willing to engage in that, to invest the time, energy, effort, resources, to take out ads in the paper, to publicize this venture, please, at least, don't stand in their way. Even if you're not willing to give them your support. I had a lot of other things I had to say, but you're looking as exhausted as I feel, so. Thank you so much, and uh, for at least hearing me out. And may Allah bless you, and bless you and your children, and your children's children. And, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Jazakallah al khair. That was wonderful. Uh, okay, we have uh, 15 minutes, inshallah, for questions and answers. And I beg you, please, please, if you have a comment, wait to the end. Or come and deliver it directly after the 15 minutes, inshallah. Unless you have a question and please make it short, come. All right? Otherwise, please stay there, write it, and they can answer it for you, inshallah, after. 10.30, all right? I'm going to say one thing, okay? Short questions, no statements. Short questions, no statements. If you're going to make a statement, I'm actually going to interrupt you because that's the only way we're going to get through this tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one question is uh, for a uh, blonde hair brother. Uh, I want you to know that I'm not American, but uh, in some way you are not alone in your problems. Uh, many times I came to Masjid, I pray on the front of the other Muslims, and then after that they came ask me if I'm Muslim. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I came from the part of uh, Europe where other people didn't know that uh, they are until 10 years ago that they are Muslims. They are just like most of us here don't know that there are 40 million Muslims in China right now and they are suffering also. And but uh, I see there is a uh, many negative things that you saw. I agree with you totally. But uh, during the your experience and uh, your life as a Muslim, do you see any changes in a good way? I mean, I have experience in the masjids where I went. You, you are true, totally. Your, your, your speech is true, and I agree with it. But uh, in some way, from the male side in Islam, I see some positive things that they are getting to. And my other, so my question is, do you see same thing? I mean, it's not. Well, I would close that question. And the other question is for all three of you. Uh, if uh, you are living in a com community which uh, there is a masjid or Islamic center or community center, and uh, in some reasons uh, they are elder people, more res respectable people, but in some way they are shutting you down or everybody who has a new idea, they kind of shut you down or they ignore you. You know what I'm talking about. We are all facing, especially our sisters in Islam. So, uh, do you think, uh, do you rec I mean, is there, would you approve if like, uh, if you are, if you, if you've been long time ignored in your community, uh, do you think that it's good idea to separate from that community and or form another new one? Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. I don't mind. No, I, I could. I just don't want to hog the microphone. Uh, concerning the first question, I have seen, uh, of course, I've seen uh, some change uh, among, uh, in the communities over the last 20 years. But from my perspective, it's, it's, take coming along too slowly because uh, our kids are growing up. I mean, if it takes another 10 years before we, you know, make a little more change, 
then we'll probably lose another generation. You know, so, I mean, the clock is ticking. So, you know, I'm really asking for a radical uh, intros introspection on our part. is really needed. Uh, as far as the other question, I'll, I'll let these two take it. I'm, I'm sure they'll agree with me. You noticed in my speech I didn't emphasize separating yourself from the community, but establishing other uh, uh, ventures, other institutions that don't compete with the community, but work, hopefully working with the community, but maybe, you know, they will not give you your support. But, you know, an other, uh, uh, a mosque that could be modeled on the Mecca plan where you could draw people in, hopefully it'll get the support of the community, but, you know, that, that venture has to be carried out no matter what. But I don't see that as an alternative community. I just see it as a part of the community that's fulfilling an essential function of, a, of our mission here in America. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, of course the answer is no for the second question. Otherwise, we're going to have a new community every day. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, remember we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his plan that he's going to test you and you're going to be faced with different people from different backgrounds. And most of the times these people, they have good intention too, but the, the only thing missing is just uh, knowledge or they're ignorant or they're not, they're mistaught or they need someone who, teach, who, teach, who can teach them and be patient with them. And that's part of the uh, working for the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there are some cases that you don't have choice because you just feel you find yourself just just losing your energy losing your time but those are really exceptions you have to be very very careful and it's not anyone who can make those dis dis decisions unity in islam it's one of the highest things and it's really uh, very crucial and you, we don't play with it so if there there are uh, problems in the community work to solve them and ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be patient be patient, be patient, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you do that. Unless there are some really uh, serious exceptions, then you don't have any choice. Allah alam. Ditto. Ditto? <laughs> No, you, you, you can't. We have to be careful about this bit of making divisions. And um, like Brother Jeffrey said, we can have other things that are happening within the community that will work as assets to our particular Islamic center or masjid. But don't start a new masjid. Try to develop the unity and just the work that you want to do. Do this and build it in with your, your center, and in time, inshallah, it will become a part of it. But you never give up on your community. Yeah, brother uh, Jeffrey Lang, you made us feel very sad tonight and broke our hearts from what we heard about our brothers, how they arrogant and ignorant about Islam. And they forgot the only woman mentioned in the Quran by name is Maryam. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentioned many a hadith how to respect our woman when he said, Ummak thumma ummak thumma ummak thumma abuk. Three mothers he mentioned the woman. And Islam will never spread in this country and in other parts of the globe if we ignore the woman. We have to raise the flag and hold it very firm, very firm, and say respect women because they are our daughters, our wives, our sisters. This is the only way Islam will spread in this globe. Jazakallah khairan for what we mentioned today. And inshallah, I will... For my part, I will spread this word, inshallah, and I hope everyone here will do the same thing, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, uh, And you too. <laughs> okay, my question is addressed to Sister Amina. I. My question was addressed to Sister Amina. I. You gave us a lot of things to think about tonight. And my question was, let's say we check ourselves and we see that we are slightly malficient or extremely malficient in one of these categories, could you give us some specific ideas on how to improve? Not just general, but kind of more specific. You know, it, it, SubhanAllah, this is one of the most beautiful questions I think I've ever been asked. And I can't believe this is being asked by one so young. MashaAllah, it gives me such hope for the future.
and, and seeing such a, a really astute question being asked. Thank you. Um, as far as what we can really do to change ourselves, I find the most important thing is to come to know Allah. And I suggest this, you know, through studying the attributes and seeing how they apply. I know some of the, the sisters, anyway, who've been with me for the last couple of days have been hearing a lot about this in particular. But making a conscientious effort to apply what you will learn about the Creator, Allah, to yourself and seeing how it should influence your conduct and behavior. It's really not hard to be a Muslim. It's not hard. It's easy to be a Muslim. We make it hard because we burden it with so many superficial things that other people can see. You know, how do you tie your hijab? How do you wear your hair? How long is your beard? Okay, we have all of these wonderful things that we can judge each other. Oh, he's better than he is because his beard is longer or he wears a kufi and he doesn't wear a kufi. And oh my God, did you see that one had a necklace on yesterday? When we're not looking at, at what's inside, um, we judge each other very harshly. We make other people afraid of us. Muslims are afraid of Muslims more than they are of non-Muslim. When Brother Jeffrey is talking about the situation of our young people, I spend most of my time on university campuses and most of these young people were born and raised in this country and yet they still connect themselves also with another country and they all tell me how much they are afraid of Muslims. They're afraid to go to the masjid because they're going to be criticized for this. They're afraid to participate in this particular thing because they're going to be criticized for something else. So they just stay away. And I have them tell me, you know, I feel safer with the non-Muslims because they're not so critical. We change ourselves by, first of all, knowing who Allah is. And you learn that through the 99 attributes. And then just changing one little tiny thing at a time. And I, I've actually named several of them, you know, not judging each other. That's a, that's a biggie, okay? Trying to exhibit the attributes of Allah that should be shown through us, you know, His mercy, His compassion. Not burdening our Islam with superficial things. Don't worry about what other people think of you. They can't put you in heaven. They can't put you in hell. That's the biggest thing to remember. Nobody, it doesn't matter if they like you or not. It doesn't matter if they tar and feather me later today. What matters is between Allah and me. No one else puts me in heaven. No one else puts me in hell. I'm gonna come. Um, I wanted to. I came late, and I wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed your lecture, Jeffrey Lang, uh, Mr. Lang. Um, I've been a convert for about uh, ten years, and it really moved me, and it uh, really reminded me of my own experience. I've seen so many, even men leave, you know, come, and I see their faces, and they come a few times, and then you don't see them anymore, and. It seems like almost uh, a problem. I know this has been addressed numerous times of, you know, you have the Arabs over here and the Pakistanis over here and this group over here. And there's no support group for new con converts when they first come. I look at, uh, I have lots of friends who are Mormons and other religions, and they set up, they do a much better job of keeping committees or whatever going to, to encourage these people to come. But we get in our social groups here and there and everywhere, and then we have this lethargy. I don't mean to be lecturing, I'm getting to my question, but I don't know how to overcome that kind of lethargic. Me and uh, several other Muslims, American Muslims and other Muslims, have tried to get things started for the kids to encourage them young, to develop their pride. But it's the parents, you know, you get Boy Scouts started and the kids are excited, 
and the parents don't bring them. They don't sign them up. They don't see the importance of it. The same thing with Girl Scouts or when we have movie nights or this night. The kids don't come. The people don't bring them. And we need to encourage these kids young to start developing a pride and start the kind of conversations that they need to have when they get older, to have that support group to talk to. And I don't know how to... That's my question. How do we overcome that kind of lethargic attitude that we face? Who's here for two, three years? We <laughs> <laughs> hope you're not here for two or three years. <laughs> <clears throat> I guess just keep trying. You know, to keep trying. Keep communicating that message. Don't don't give up. I've been do saying it for 20 years. You know, I'm still trying. Uh, I don't have much hope that you know anybody will listen to me. But you know, even if I even if I uh, die, uh, you know. Whenever, even if I die with those uh, being the last words on my lips, at least I know I tried. You know, I, I'm not saying I'm always right. I'm not saying that you know I uh, that uh, I have all the answers, but I'm just doing the best that I can. But about your uh, comment about even men converting to this religion and leaving soon after, that phenomenon happens much more often than with women. The past year, we've had two converts on the uh, Lawrence, Kansas campus convert to the religion. They went to a couple of Friday prayers and they never showed up again. And uh, it happens year in, year out. Male converts especially don't stay in the religion. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know what it is, women have, well, women are just stronger. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just true. <laughs> the, there is a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu but before mentioning the hadith, I would like to say something, which is uh, something for the people who reverted to Islam. You might think that once you've reverted to Islam, you're going to go to the mosque, you're going to find angels. It's like, when the, well, it's like the one who gets married and uh, he's expecting an angel. Right? Really? And that's not right. That's, that's not the way it is. You're going to go to the mosque or the Islamic center, you're going to find people practice in Islam, you're going to find maybe a lot of um, ignorance and misbehavior and mischaracter. And again, it's part of that test that you're going to, to face. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to put you through that test to see, well, are you really getting to Islam from the door or from the window? Which one? Now, let me come back to the hadith, Prophet Sallallahu The way you are, you'll be governed. So, and when you, I, I, I was listening to one of the, uh, one of the experts in uh, whatever they call it, human science, uh, social. social science research, and he said something really interesting. He said, when you choose the behavior, you choose the consequences. In other words, if you do not try to change it, then that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to last, and that's why Prophet Islam said, the way you are, the way you will be governed. In other words, if you do not change it, that's the way it's going to stay, and that's the garbage we have in back home, because people are not doing what's supposed to be done so that we change that dictatorship, and people are just keeping quiet. So the first thing is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have angels in the mosques or in, in, in Islamic centers. As wives are not angels and husbands are not, are not angels either. Uh, and it's a test and we have to, 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 to choose the behavior so that the consequence, consequences are the right consequences. And we have to work on it. And we should work on it. And whatever you do and whatever you face, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward you for that. And whatever patience you have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that. It's good to, to, to tell these things to the non-Muslims and to the uh, new revert Muslims so that they don't get any misunderstanding what Islam is, what Muslims are, and what the practice and the real message, the difference between the two. One more question, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My question, Dr. Jeffrey. Uh, in a way, the three speeches, in my opinion, complement each other. Uh, one of the main areas you mentioned in your speech is the lack of scholars here in this country. And in my opinion, that's number one. Lack of knowledge, you know, is one of the main reasons we have of too many things we see here. So, uh, as far as I know, there are two 
universities in this country which are teaching ulum al-Quran and ulum al-Hadith, both Quran and Hadith. And I just want everybody here to know that they can attend that either full-time and or part-time basis. The second, which is my question to you, does it help if American kids from second or third or fourth generation, as you mentioned, will get scholarships in Muslim countries where they have highly recognized Islamic universities? You'll find that in Al-Azhar, you'll find that in Morocco, you'll find that in Tunisia. That's at least the areas I know about. So does that help if you have those American kids will go there memorize Quran, know about Hadith, because one of the main goals should be 10 or 15 years from now, every single Imam in an Islamic center should have the knowledge. Jazakumullah yeah. khair. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah I, th I think it could help to send our uh, boys and girls to, uh, to Islamic institutions abroad to, uh, to learn from uh, uh, classical scholarship you know, the, the uh, sciences. It's also important, though, that our scholars in, in the West also come to learn and understand and be able to utilize the modern, you know, the latest and, and uh, the latest methods and understand the, the current developments in the s social sciences and in, sci and in and in historical and social re science research. Are you following me? Because if they're going to reach the population that they have to work with, the population that, under, that speaks and, and communicates and thinks in that mode, they're going to have to master that mode as well. You see, are you following me? So, I'm th so I, I think it's extremely important that we urge you know, bright young Muslims you know, to get education in America, in the social sciences, in the religious, in religious studies, in uh, historical studies, and then if they are gifted, they'll want to go. They'll actually want to go to the Muslim lands because we want them to direct their, and like you said, scholarships would be extremely beneficial, research scholarships would ex be extremely beneficial in this regard because we want them to take that knowledge that they learn here, the current methods of historical and social research, and then we want to take them and learn of this great body of information, this great legacy that we've inherited from the past. We want them to study it and be able to now communicate what they learned to the Western audience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we want them to take from the modern, you know, from, from their current environment, what knowledge needs to be gained, and we want them to apply that research capability to studying the legacy that is uh, before them. Are you following me? Exactly. That's why I said, I mean, you need somebody who was born and raised here. That's the best case scenario. So yes. they know about the issues here, okay? Yes. And then if they go... The issues, the mode of thought, the current and, methods of research, because if they just communicate in a, say, in a level that is foreign, in a, in a mode of thought and in a dialectic that is foreign to this society, they, they will not be able to reach the, the audience that they want to reach. Are you following me? Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I have to add one thing on there, okay? I, I promise I'll make it quick, all right? Because uh, Brother Jeffrey brought it up and he said, our boys and girls, all right? The brother only said about educating the men. The most important thing, subhanAllah, is to educate the women. The women are the first teachers of the children. If the women do not have the knowledge, the women do not have the practice, the children are going to have a very hard time having it. We concentrate so much on educating the men. It's time we concentrated on educating the women. <laughs> I think Amina mostly wanted to just make that clear for the audience. But even if he did, you have to realize that when you, in Arabic, men is a generic term. It can include men and women. And I, you know, so, and I understood that to be the sense of what he said. So, but for the rest of the audience, just so that nobody gets the wrong idea, huh? <laughs>